in studio today. Um, my name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm an artist and I'm located in East Hampton, New York, 100 miles east of New York City, and about three miles from the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center, which of course is the home of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner. And most of you I know through my work at the Pollock Krasna House where I'm the education coordinator. So, um, I am always evolving as every human being is um, in terms of my creativity. And since the pandemic, I've had more time. You know, I realize I do need to get back to not just the production of my own art, because I've always made art, but making myself more visible as an artist. I really focused a lot on giving back to the community as an educator and an author, but that's not to say I've always created art all, all throughout those years. And, you know, then I said, well, don't feel too bad about it because Lee Krasner did the same thing. So she also put her career on the back burner while she was supporting Jackson Pollock's art. And she also painted all along. And then when the time was right, she got back into, you know, her own career as an artist, okay? so. That's a little bit about that. So I'd like to share with you my creative process as an artist, and then I'd love to hear from you and just have a discussion, okay? So here I am in my studio, and um, I'll show you work that I did earlier, and it almost looks like two different people did this work. Um, but I know what the similarities are, but it wouldn't be obvious to if you just looked at it quickly. So this is just, I'll give you an overview that my current work is very colorful and it doesn't have sort of a deep psychological message. It's, it's more of a visual puzzles or like um, seeing words embedded into the design. And it's ambiguous. So as you look at it, you might see words, you might see designs, and the words themselves at first look cheerful and simplistic. But then if you look more closely, you see that it could be sort of read in different ways. Okay, so all of this, this is all part of a series. These are three by four paintings. So we'll get back to this in more detail. But I want to show you my earlier work, which, like I said, it looks like a completely different person did it. So just a little backstory. Um, I had the good fortune to grow up on Long Island in a really beautiful neighborhood in Nassau County and with wonderful parents and siblings and everything you would want a home to be at that time in the 1960s. Went to a great public school, had every opportunity in terms of education through a public school system with a great art program. And um, unfortunately, when I was a teenager, my brothers became very ill and I don't wanna get into the details of the illness because it's beyond the scope of this talk, but let's just suffice to say that it was very troubling as a teenager and then my brother Raymond died when he was 25 and I was 19. And there were many other losses that followed that in a very traumatic way. And so I processed this through my art. And I was, there was all sorts of, I did hundreds of drawings about grieving and the anxiety that this loss brought me. And eventually I turned away from painting using very fragile materials to address some of these issues. So these are just examples. Um, I made these, what I call doll sculptures. This one actually needs to be repaired. Um, but what I did is working on the form of a Barbie doll. <clears throat> it's the same size and proportion. I wanted to sort of show the inversion of a Barbie doll. A Barbie doll is sort of this cultural um, iconic image of what a girl should be at that time, right? It's a commercialized image. And I wanted to show sort of what would be on the inside of a young woman, right? 
who is sort of steeped in these ideas of being nice and girly and all that kind of stuff. And what happens when you repress some of those really strong emotions that I was experiencing. Now I was coming of age in the 1980s. And what I realized is even at that time after the women's revolution, there was really still, I'm sure anyone who's old enough realizes, there were really still a lot of ideas for women on the media and in society. Um, this, there was like a holdover in some ways from that 1950s idea. So anyway, what I did is I wanted to work with fragile materials to kind of address the idea of vulnerability and loss. So this one is made out of tissues that are stained with tea. And then I cut them into tiny little rectangles and sew them together piece by piece. It's soft sculpture, but to an extreme. And the pose is sort of acquiescing, right? So it it's, plays on this idea that on the one hand, it's really very labor intensive to make this. And on the other hand, it could just disappear because it's so fragile. This one is actually made of lint from my dryer that I pressed to make almost like a felt and then cut it into these rectangles and sewed it together. So they also kind of deal with issues of femininity like doing laundry and repetitive work. And this one is made of latex gloves that I had in my studio from painting. That's why they're stained. And the inside is actually stuffed with Vaseline and so when you touch it, it sort of is pliable and it forms the shape of anyone who's holding it. So it's about kind of being malleable and conforming to outside, outside influences. So the works are so dainty and small, they kind of invite a closeness, but yet people, like they'll get nervous about that and be like, I don't want to come close to them like they're too, what if I, you know, shouldn't you put them in a case or shouldn't you do this? But that's, I want to kind of invite that, that paradox, drawing something in, but yet also kind of keeping it away at the same time. Any questions so far, ideas? Okay. So working on that note, for years I worked, eight years I worked at the Museum of Modern Art as the family programs coordinator. I didn't have a lot of time, it was a full-time job. So I had to devise a way of making art that you could just sit down and make it without a lot of setup. And so I did these scrolls, which I'll show you in a moment, that are sort of like meditative scrolls. And I would do it literally like it was religious. I would do it like a half hour a day before I went to work. And at first I thought, this is, this is absurd. Like who does art half hour? You're never gonna get anywhere with that. But with that kind of tenacity, after eight months, I finished a piece. And these works are actually my, I think my favorite things that I've ever made. So normally they, they hang on a wall, but today I just had them laid out on a table because I actually just had my house painted, so I had to take them down and I didn't have time to put them back up. They're kind of hard to, to hang. So this is an example. I think it might be hard to see. This one right here, it says the word mommy. Can you see that? And mommy is stitched in, it's embroidered in over and over and over again. And it's sort of like a cry for your mother right? You could interpret it a lot of ways. It also has to do with me realizing, I realized I didn't think I was going to have children because I just didn't see that happening, that kind of marital life. And um, so it's layered in its meaning. But again, this is really about grieving. And the process with these this scroll is as, as tall as I am. It's, it's the height that I am. And what I did is I took rectangles. I mean, I took stained, stained tissues that kind of harden when they're stained with tea. And then I tore the edges to make these rectangles. 
And then every day I would stitch in that word mommy. And then eventually when I had enough rectangles, I would sew them together at six pieces. And then eventually I would put each patch together to form one scroll. I also did another one called Patience and Virtue, where I also um, stitched in, which is very hard to see on a camera. But if you look really, really closely in white, there's the word patience or virtue stitched into every rectangle. And then I did another one uh, with an Emily Dickinson poem, which is this one. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves ceremoniously like tombs, the stiff heart questions. Was it he that bore in yesterday, centuries before? So the Emily Dickinson poem is about this phase of grief when you sort of like, not the initial phase, but when the people go away and you're just stuck with this feeling, this like numb feeling, which I'm sure we, if you've experienced grief, you, you, you can, if you read that poem, it's very related. So how did I go? <laughs> from doing this, right, with it's monochromatic, it's really about grieving for the most part. How do I go from that to doing this? Well, thankfully, you know, over the course of time, although it's not only time, it's really evolving as a human being and my spirituality and all the support that I got and, you know, going through acceptance with these various losses and coming out on the other end where I realized that I really can enjoy life. And it's not so much life goes on, that's a given. The loss is always there, but it takes a different form. And then I actually found meaning in it. That's when I started my company to, to give back, to help other people express themselves. And I'm at a completely different point in my life where I just feel happy. What's not to like? I live in East Hampton in one of the most beautiful places in the world. My family is well, I'm well. I work at the Pollock Krasna House and Study Center, which is spectacular. I have time to paint. What's not to have? what's not to like. It's like, I have a really good life and I'm surrounded by beauty. So I have a playful side to myself and I just love bright colors. So this is an example of one that I did. And it says, can't figure it out. If you look very closely into the words and the lines, the it is in the center. And it's kind of like a visual maze where if you just sit in front of the painting, your eye will kind of come in and out of these lines, like, and then go into one of the lines of the letters will then become like, for example, a negative shape or a positive shape will come forward and it plays with your perception in that way. And it's sort of, it's just deadpan tongue in cheek. You can't figure it out, but you actually are figuring it out as you look at the painting. So how did I do this? I do small sketches and I just sort of let it flow out that the, what I'm drawing mimics the phrase, but I'm not really thinking about it. And then I do use a projector. I project it onto the canvas and trace it. And at the beginning, it's interesting, it's really hard actually, because there's so much going on. It is almost like observational painting, like if you painted a still life or a landscape, I'm looking at the sketch and I'm kind of following it along, um, you know, really trying to put that onto the canvas and it's, it's hard. Um, but then I let that go and I just do the, I just paint and I just improvise on the painting itself. And often like in this one, I really simplified it a lot. I got rid of a lot of stuff that was in the original sketch. So that's that one. And this is one of my favorite ones. 
this painting says down here, this says full, if you look really closely. And again, it's kind of like, oh, that's so cheerful, what cheery colors. But it's kind of excessively full. And so again, it's <laughs> ambiguous. It's like, well, full. Usually you think of that as a good thing, right? My life is so full. My stomach is full. But we all know anything in ex excess is not so good, right? So it's it's almost like over, it's like over full, overactive, right? The colors are like not just bright, but they almost kind of fight against each other. They're complementary colors. So we have green against red or blue against um, orange. So it's almost like jarring and it's like jam packed. So this one over here, again, it's like a visual maze. Look, there you go. And it says face it and the word it is embedded into the design three times. It's large and then it's medium size and then small in the center. And this is one of my favorite ones because it's just fun to look at. And the lines remind me almost like thread, like you can move through them and see different things as you go along. And it's just entertaining. I usually have it like above my fireplace so I could like look at it when I sit on the couch, okay. And this one over here, this says free. And again, it's, it's, it's ambiguous, like, oh, free is happy. We all wanna be free. But it actually has like a darkness to it because literally, but it looks like the letters F-R-E-E -E, it almost looks like they're trying to get out. Like it's free, but it's almost like screaming a little bit. Like for example, over here, this little shape here, and here's the top of the E, which I'm sure is difficult to see on Zoom, but it's almost like it's screaming. It's like, it's, there's like an anxiety because first off becoming free can be really challenging. And having freedom itself can be challenging, right? Some people feel lost when they're too free, right? So now I'm gonna throw out a question. Do you see any similarities between the technique or the paintings and the earlier work? This one's in process, it says fluid. Huh. Anybody? Well, I, I mean, I, I'll say like, you know, there's a grid relationship um, in the early work and the language connection, um, even though the form and the color, I mean, the big change is all the beautiful color, uh, the vibrant color and the, emotional content of the color, um, which was missing in the early work. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I mean, those are the similarities I see. Yeah, thank you, Jan. And also the word similar to um, like the patient's virtue word is similar right. in some ways to this where you go, oh, patience, like I'm very patient, Jan. You know, so people always like, <laughs> Patient. Oh, thank you. You're so patient. And then after a while, you're like, maybe I should be so patient. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, is that really a good, is patience really a virtue or is there a time where you should just say enough? Done being patient. But so there's sort of like this, it's a subtle deadpan humor also that not like an overt humor or there's like the paradox in there. So cool. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, I see that. And also, I think that, um, like my own sensibility, there's always an irony in life, right? So I teach abstract expressionism at uh, the Paula Krasna House, and I do hundreds of programs about how to use paint experimentally and with very fluid and dripping paint and scraping and 
Pollock, it's a physical release of energy. It's the abstract expressionist. And yet my own work, you cannot see one brushstroke, right? You cannot see the artist mark. I completely obliterate the brushstroke. And it's tight, it's tight, it's tightly painted. And that is also clearly in the little dolls, in the sculptures, in the scrolls. I actually find it very calming to do work almost like knitting in a way that you can kind of do this repetitive action in some degree that it's, it's methodical. I find that to be calming. It's almost like a meditation, right? Mm. So I have no desire to swoosh paint around. Yeah, of course it's fun when I'm doing the workshop, but for my own artwork, I don't know, maybe that will evolve in the future. It's just not my sensibility. But within that, there's a lot of movement and play and almost like a dance and a rhythm in my paintings, but it's not expressed in, a, in that physically, you know, fluid abstract expressionist way. It's expressed in a way that's very compacted, all that energy, right? And even in the scrolls that I showed you, it's very emotional, right? So in that way, it's very expressive, but it is within the grid format and it's very, like I said, methodically done. So I was very inspired. I saw this movie years ago, like Water for Chocolate. It's a Mexican film mm -hmm. and it's, you've seen it, it's beautiful. And the woman is yeah. grieving. And she, I always remember that image where she's driving away on the carriage and she's crocheting a blanket and the blanket just goes on forever. It's surreal. It's this long, and she just keeps crocheting it and crocheting it. And I thought that was like a really good expression of grief. So anyway, that's a little bit about me. Does anybody have any thoughts, comments, or questions about art in general or art in East Hampton or my work or anything else? Or you can share your work as well, of course. Molly? It, 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 it occurs to me that you're, um the methodical aspect of your work, which I see in everything that you showed, and then progressing to more and more color, your, that, that your um, comfort in the, in the method and the repetition al allows that progression of the, of the freedom of color. So you're, you 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 you're 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 birthing from that comfort area of the and am I making sense of the method in your you know with the letters there are you know these block letters that are contained that containment within that is your freedom of ex expressing in the color and that and that transitioning to that over time as you as you, I, I'm always looking at the psychology. No, I <laughs> and, I see, interesting. and are you, are, are you in that field or are you? Are no, you I was, a, I was a teacher. <laughs> uh, and I did, I, I was a preschool teacher. I taught all the way through and did a lot of art with the students. You know, and I, I really enjoy looking at your, the work that you're doing with students. And I worked with special needs students and just that whole, um, wonderful world of, of um, bringing, bringing people into art, but I don't have a, um, I just love art. I do all sorts of art and I'm just trying to find, I, I copy, uh, I'm, not, I'm, I explore, I have so many different mediums and I, I just love to study. So this is an opportunity when I found, found you on Eventbrite to, to learn and, but I'm trying to find, now at 70, who I, so I can express myself through my knowledge of art, just the way you, you found your signature, you know, you know who you're evolving with who you are. And I'm really looking for that opportunity for myself, but I don't know that I have, you know, building that confidence of, 
I don't know if I have all the knowledge to be able to sit down and you know take all the I have a little studio here and take each piece and put it together so that it expresses me that I, I'm working toward that in my older years <laughs> yeah, well that's wonderful Molly and thank you for sharing that and you know what it is about being an artist Molly you could be 70 you could be experienced you could have started art when you're 15 or 60 whatever right you're always a beginner now what does that mean you're always a beginner what is she there's always a vulnerability yeah, yeah. so because otherwise you would just are you you're just resting on your laurels there's you know no one wants to be i don't think jan you're in the arts so you know like you don't want to be like doing things by rope. Like you've become so good at it that there's nothing new to explore. Right. There's always new things to explore. Now, some artists do that within a very small range, like Mondrian. He does, you know, it's eventually the range is narrow, but within that he explores so much. Someone like Picasso, he's trying ceramics and murals and all different mediums, right? So there's right. no right or wrong. But it really is the idea that you're never 100% sure of yourself as an artist right. or even a human being. As right. soon as a human being stops right. learning, that's not healthy, right. Right? right? That's what, you know, you always have to adventure into. And I feel the same way. I feel very, I feel vulnerable because it's, I have it down. Like I am a very uh, seasoned educator. I know how to speak about art. I'm very good at public speaking, if I do say so myself. I've had a lot of practice. But now I'm turning that corner where I'm like, all right, well, show your own art. And then, of course, every once in a while, I'm like, well, what if, what if this or that? Like, doubt comes in, right? Yeah. And then yeah. I'm like, oh, forget it. Just appreciate the moment and be done with it. Like, that's all it's about. Yeah. Just yeah. throw it, you know, whatever it is, you, it just be in the moment. Yeah. Does that make sense? Hey, absolutely. Yes. So Molly, um, I do hope, you know, go to pkhouse.org because I do a lot of workshops through the Pollock House. Okay. They're all free on Zoom. Some okay. of them are talks, some of them are tours, some of them are guest speakers, some of them are hands-on. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Anyone else? So Joyce, I'd like to thank you for giving those uh, Zoom uh, classes because, um, in the pandemic, I'm from Canada actually, and um, I, 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 I was down in, um, in uh, Southampton and, and that area because I had work in, in the gallery there, um, a printmaker, I'm a printmaker. And so uh, we were allowed to uh, come to your uh, house. And, um, and then when you offer these Zooms, they were really very, very, um, they saved me and I, I, cause I, I really felt very isolated. Um, I wasn't seeing my friends. I live in the country and you gave me um, a window to just look at uh, what's happening, what's going on and, and just a, a thought process that I really appreciate. And I wanted to say today, I really appreciated um, the explanation about the dolls because I saw them um, uh, in the pre your previous Zoom, and I wondered, I thought they were maybe made of clay, but now you talked about the process of how you made them and how you put them together, and um, I found that, yeah, very, very, um, I don't want to say interesting. I just found it, um, that, that whole uh, unstructured of having all these pieces and then putting them all together and then producing a work of art. Uh, extremely interesting. So um, I thank you very much for offering your studio because it's always nice to see where people work and what, what, their, what, what their surroundings are. And also to see your progression of your work. You know, um, years and years and years I did collage and then I found printmaking and it was like, wow, this is a different world. And so um, I too have tried to find a different way of, um, of showing my, 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 uh, my artwork. And so, you know, from um, flat two pieces to uh, three-dimensional work where I had this 
produced a series of shoes, you know, for the show. And I was, I was really, um, yeah, I was very, very interesting to hear her. Their I love that. I, I love that, Jane. And next, through the Paula Krasna House, I do these monthly virtual Zoom cafes. And we have one on October 8th called Make, Show, and Sell. So we always focus on different topics. And it's like a gathering of artists. So if you'd like to come to that, go to the website, and then you can show us your work. And you know, we all brainstorm so, um, and share. And it's just fun. It would be like having an artist group, but it's all virtual. And we get people from all over the world. So We enjoyed your progression, your discussion of the process and the way you work through the grief part of it, which is something I think we all, you know, find solace in our making art. That it's a large part of what it's about is coming to terms with what happens in your life. And uh, it's it's hopeful that you've arrived at this, you know, somewhat ambiguous, you know, because there's this tension in your work. It's it's not all good, but it's not all bad either, you know, so it's... Uh, Thank you, Jan. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think you've landed in a very interesting place. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And I mean, life is amazing. You know, if you live long enough, you get to experience. Nobody gets, gets out of this lifetime without experiencing loss. But There's no free that, pass, no. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you're just going to. Um, but also really... For, for all human beings, really, you know, that resilience, if you just get that support and find a way to find joy, there's a tremendous resilience within the human spirit. So I'm extremely grateful for that. I really am. I'm like, every day, I'm so grateful. So anyway, everyone, enjoy this. Very cool. Sunday, wherever you are. And I'm really appreciative. Thank you for coming you. by. Yeah. Thank Good luck so with the rest of your tour. Have a great day. Thank you. Good Thank day. You. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Nice meeting you all. Nice, nice to meet you all. It's great.